the week two of the Elf in the Room, and so uh, we're excited to jump into this passage and jump into our conversations here. So, John, you preached this past weekend, and so uh, why don't you just give us a little summary of what happened here? Yeah, so the, the elephant in the room for this passage is this, is, is this question, and it's really um, a pretty serious question and a heavy question and almost a frightening question to ask, which, which Jesus essentially asks him, are you laying up treasure for yourself? Or are you rich toward God? And that's that's the heavy question that we have to ask ourselves and to evaluate and to do so um, with soberness, with honesty, um, and then also almost assuredly with repentance. Because no matter where we are spiritually, there is surely a part of, of all of us, and including myself in this, that's laying up. Uh, and, and becoming rich toward men yeah. and not rich toward God. And so that's that's the difficult question uh, that we have to ask ourselves. Yeah. Give us a little a background. Like, yeah, what, you read uh, Luke 12, this story, kind of what's happening in Jesus' interaction with, with this rich uh, ruler. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Luke 12 kind of is interesting passage. It, it happens sort of in this whole series of passage passages um, that in a lot of ways are sort of asking these eternal questions of the audience. Um, these kind of what is going to happen at the end of your life when you stand before God kind of questions. And so uh, this particular question, uh, even for those of us who are familiar with the passage, it was surprising for me to, to sort of to read the question again because I'd forgotten it. Um, it was a very kind of practical question uh, of, a, of a brother who says, hey, I'm a second born. Why don't you tell my firstborn brother that the fair thing for him to do is to give me half of the inheritance. Um, it's an interesting question because it shows that this is a listener who has been listening to Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, he's seen Jesus kind of up in all of these cultural expectations. And, and you could see he, he's like, hey, let, let's see if that'll work for me here. Yeah. Um, it also is surprising because given the fact that he's a, a second born, we don't know what his social standing was, but he certainly was not as rich as his brother was. Nowhere near, in fact, as rich as what his brother would have been. And so that there's, there's certain um, uh, sort of implicit things that are going on in his heart that I think connect a lot with us, which is that for it really doesn't matter where you are. If you ask pretty much any American, they're going to say, I'm not rich. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of us are going to identify as not rich. That person's rich. Yeah. My older brother's rich. I'm not rich. And so that connects with us. The fairness connects with us. I mean, if there's anything about money that sort of connects with us, it's that fairness thing. Um, I would be okay if I made what my boss made. I would be okay if I had the house that my neighbor had. I would be okay if I had the car my brother had, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And that's the question that, that's being asked here, which doesn't feel when you sort of strip it away it doesn't feel to us actually like this like like this money grubbing kind of guy because he he wouldn't have been the guy that would have struck you as a money grubbing kind of guy he's just like us it, yeah that's as you say it doesn't seem that way because that's human nature yeah. everybody is that way yeah, yeah. Why, why is it easy for us to, put, to play this comparison game, to look at somebody else and go, I mean, if I had a little bit more, if I had that, like, why is it so easy for us and why do we so ten, you know, easily fall into that trap? Yeah. It, it goes back to right outside the gates of the garden, Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. The very first story we have outside the yeah. gates of the garden are this comparison yeah. of one offering being acceptable, one offering being not. And so... We have in us, one of the first things I think that sin does to us and that twists us is that we judge ourselves on those around us. Mm -hmm. We judge ourselves on our righteousness. Yeah. We judge ourselves on our happiness. We judge ourselves on, um, on our financial well-being, yeah. on those around us. Um, and of course, by human nature, we're not going to select those around us who are just below us. Mm -hmm. We're going to select those around us who are just above us. Yeah. Well, and there's competition in it. So, so yeah. you know, one guy is totally happy with his income. He has no complaints. He's really blessed until he finds out that the guy in the cubicle next to him makes more. Mm -hmm. 
and now is why do they pay him? What, what? You could give a you could give someone a hundred thousand dollar bonus, and they'd be like, whoa, yeah. and this is fantastic. But if the guy in the cubicle next to him got a five hundred thousand dollar bonus, all of a sudden be what? what? How, are you kidding me? And I, I'm exaggerating numbers, yeah. but that it, it's true all around us. Mm-hmm. The the family is okay until the brother learns that the sister. Uh, got something more than they did in the inheritance mm-hmm. or uh, uh, you know uh, mom passed away and, um, and 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 your brother went in and took uh, that set of vases that you know is worth six thousand dollars and just took them mm-hmm. and now how, yeah. like we start comparing against everything and we're not happy if somehow we don't think it's fair, which is exactly what this younger brother does. He doesn't think it's fair. Yeah. What are the dangers of <clears throat> sometimes we, we know it in our, in our, you know, in our heart and sometimes we don't really re- we realize that we're comparing or doing this game or the dangers of, of this comparison game in our own spiritual lives. Well, so, so the parable that Jesus gets into is fascinating because he talks. So he talks to a guy who doesn't think he's rich. Mm-hmm. And he talks to him about a rich man. He says, and of course he wants him to identify with that rich man. And he says, here's what happens with the rich man. The rich man has everything he needs already. He has it, he gets even more rich. He has an even better crop. And what does he do? What happens with his heart in that moment? Nothing changes. And so uh, the question Jesus is asking is, what happens when you get to that next rung? What happens if your brother were to give you half the inheritance? What happens if your brother were to give you the whole inheritance? What's going to change for you in your life? And the reality is nothing's going to change. There's always another rung. There's always another way to compete. And, uh, you know, part of one of the things that's fascinating for me is to look into, like, the best athletes and this constant, like, churn that they have, this constant... Almost all of them are aggrieved, you know. So uh, an Aaron Rodgers, great quarterback for the Green Bay Packers. Like, like you can't he, – <laughs> sorry. You can't have a, 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 um, an interview with him where he doesn't bring up where he was picked in the draft, which was somewhat late, you know. Same thing with a Tom Brady. So it's, there's this constant, like, like – it's almost like we need that in our, in our human side. Yeah. And – and what, what Jesus is saying is, if you keep operating like that, you will be poor in spirit. And not in a good way. <laughs> yeah. like, like, you are going to be spiritually impoverished. You will be a beggar in the spiritual realm because it will strip away everything that you have. That's, so, so I would say, to dive deeper, what is like, when you poor in spirit and you know, like, explain that a little bit more? People are like, it means that, oh, yep. poor in spirit, that's not bad, but if I get that, I'm good. Yeah. You know, that, that, no, that's I, I would say the, the underlying reaction. thing here is satisfaction. Yeah. yeah. You want to be satisfied. And as long as our satisfaction is in this world, we will never be satisfied. Mm-hmm. For there's always an appetite for more, and this world cannot satisfy. Yeah. So until we find our satisfaction in God, mm-hmm. we will never be satisfied. Yeah. And what's... And what's neat about this parable is it even twists that, that thing, mm-hmm. which Jesus sort of projects out there. What happens if he finally were satisfied? If he finally got to that place where now I can eat, drink, and be merry? Because that's what he's been going for his whole life. And he can finally relax. And he can finally do the things he wants, which is have pleasure. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen then? His life's gone. It's all taken from him. Yeah. And then you stand for the rest of eternity as someone who has nothing in front of the Holy God. And so that's what I mean by like that spiritual poverty, which Mm -hmm. is to say, like, even if you reach that satisfaction, Mm -hmm. which can never be reached, Mm -hmm. even if you reach that, you will stand for all eternity as one who is, is penniless in, in the wealth of, in, in the wealth of the kingdom, in the wealth of heaven. So what does it look like then to kind of have a change of heart, a change of identity, a change of mindset, um, a, just a change, a change to go from wanting to pursue material stuff and wanting the next thing to go, God, 
I'm releasing it. I'm letting go. I want to find my joy, my satisfaction in, in you, that you are enough for me. What does that look like and how do we get to that? What does that process look like for us? Yeah. It's almost inherent in salvation in that we are no longer simply citizens of this world. Mm -hmm. We're citizens of the next world. We don't live for a kingdom in this world. We live for God's kingdom. Yeah. I would say it's a, it's a complete makeover of the foundation of our life mm -hmm. um, to find satisfaction in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it's an evaluation of that question. Um, what am I really living for? Mm -hmm. And um, I think for some of us, if, if we're honest, we say, hey, I'm really living for God after I get to this. Yeah. Like, I'll be fully there, yeah. but I need to get here first. Yeah. I need to accomplish this. And Jesus is saying, this starting line has to start today. Mm -hmm. Like, wherever you are, like, the fullness of your life being sold out for and given to God, like, begins where you are. If you're satisfied completely in God, wherever you are, um, then your life begins, yeah. and then your your riches in God really yeah. begin. As long as that starting point is pushed out, wherever that that point is, mm -hmm. then your life will never it will never begin yeah. fully for God. Yeah, and it really goes back <clears throat> to the conversation last week about just being a steward <clears throat> that God has it all, mm -hmm. and and processing this, you know, walking through this journey a little bit of recognizing and releasing. And then in God be in control of all our time, of all our money, of all our stuff, the people we interact with every day. And what does that look like to surrender all that to him and not yeah, hold on to pieces of it in our own lives as well? Yeah. Um, any last thoughts as we just kind of reflect back on this, this passage here? So I would, I, would, I would say this is like, so reading Christian biographies is, is a great, great thing to put in front of you. To, to see how people really deal with mm -hmm. this. And so I'll compare, and I, I don't want to sort of cast aspersions on the first one, but I was just listening to an interview with Mark Cuban. It was fascinating. So he was a billionaire, like by the time he was 30, mm -hmm. and he'd retired. But of course, like that's like, what is there to do? He was in the eat, drink, and be merry, but his life, like he was like, like I thought this is what I wanted, and it's not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and so he had to create, again, sort of another, sort of more silos to go after for him. You watch, you, you listen and read sort of the, the great steps of faith by Christians and what they walked away from mm -hmm. and where they started their journey the moment God called them. And that's profound. Yeah. Um, and I, I sort of, I'll, I'll speak very personally, like I, I feel like when God has called me um, into the hardest moments of, of these sorts of questions about myself are in the very moments I think that it's the most impossible for me to walk forward in faith. Um, and yet, today is the day. Yeah. Today is the day. Yeah. How are you, Greg, any last thoughts? Just uh, this world is not our home, first off. Um, we're, we're passing through. We, we belong to another place and another realm. And uh, so as long as we are searching for our satisfaction and pleasures in this world, yeah. it, it's going to be an empty pursuit. Yeah. Um, because it, it's not, so I don't even know Mark Cuban's story, but that same story we could give a thousand examples to. Um, because no one has ever found yeah. that complete satisfaction in this world. Yeah. So I would encourage you as you just as you process and you guys kind of talk through this a little bit as well. You would just yeah open your hearts, open your minds to what God could be speaking into you. Um, I would encourage you and as a group to talk about one way you could practically live this out is just being excited about the things God's excited about, mm -hmm. and um, and talk about this conversation of how could you use your time, your money, or your resources, and just to 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 use it for God's kingdom and to um, actively and get involved and pursue the things that God is pursuing and excited about. So week two of Elephant of the Room.